spend with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy. We're going to be continuing on a lesson that we began last week. And uh, in fact, we're going to even deal with it a little bit this afternoon. So I know sometimes people follow us on, on YouTube and things of that nature. So if you don't have a chance to get back with us again this afternoon in live stream time, then it will be uploaded or whatever it's done, and you'll have it available later on. But what we've been talking about is the fact that God has put in place a divine standard, a standard that we can look at, a standard that doesn't change, remains same. In Proverbs 16 and verse 11, we find a just balance in scales belongs to the Lord. And we talked about standards we have in society. We have a money standard. We have a time standard and so on and so forth. We have all those different things that protect us and our investments or our purchasing or whatever. And uh, we don't want to be equated uh, as they were back in the book of Judges where seven times, if memory serves me correctly, you find the phrase, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. When it comes to God, we can't do that. We can't do what we think to be right. In every day, we stand at the crossroads. We have to make a decision which way we're going to follow. So in Jeremiah, the sixth chapter, verse 16, what the appeal is, is ask for the ancient pathways. And that's what we want. We want the ancient pathways. We want the way that, that's, that's been authorized by God, set in place by God. And Jesus, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, was hearkening back to Jeremiah 6.16, in a manner of speaking. We know that the Christians were first called followers of the way. That's what we want. We want the way. A few years ago, I was holding a meeting with the brethren in San Bernardino. And as is wont there, they, they go out and they do some personal work. And uh, they asked me to go to Cal State San Bernardino. I didn't know where it was. So there's a woman and another man that, that went with me. And I go, I don't know where I'm going. And the woman in the back said, I've never been here before, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. There's this magical thing called a cell phone. She was being sarcastic. I had a cell phone sitting right there and she could see it, but I was driving. So she punched in where we needed to go. And it took us right there, led us exactly where we wanted to be. It's exactly what we do with the Word of God. That if we look at it, we can find the way. The word the is not really a word, but more an article. And it is indicative of a singular plan, uh, pattern. We talked also about in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We talked about everything being done according to design according to a pattern, and how it all, whether you talk about the universe and all that it is, is reflective of his divine pattern and a reflection of his many-sided wisdom. So Paul, when he writes in Ephesians, the third chapter, verse 10, and he talks about the church, he talks about how it is also a reflection of the many-sided wisdom of God. So there is a pattern to everything that God does. So we're now left with this question. Does the Bible really deliver truth? Or is it like those signs that have been posted in a, a parking lot? Merely suggestions. And you've heard my philosophy on that before. Are they backed by law? Are they backed by anything? On the overhead, you can see a couple of quotes 
And I found them to be rather interesting quotes because they are by religious bodies in a book that is imprimatur by the Catholic Church on page 50 of a book called Catholic Facts. The Bible, and I'm quoting now, the Bible was not intended to be a textbook of the Christian religion. Huh? I don't understand that. Everything that we are about is predicated on what is taught in the scriptures. Haley has a textbook that she uses to teach. Terry has a textbook, right? Oh, good. Physics, I don't know nothing about. I don't know nothing about economics. But I'll tell you about psychology. I had textbooks. I had textbooks that I used to teach the students, whether it be first year, fourth year, whatever. But there was a textbook. And even when I went to college, I would find an answer, and I may not have agreed with it. And this was especially as I was moving toward my doctor. And I wrote, here's the answer you want, but here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. But I realize you're, you're basing it on textbook. Here's the answer. I'm going to regurgitate it back to you. But I was honest enough to say, Here's what I believe. Would that those that were in the religious world would do the same thing. And be honest to say, I know what the Bible says. I know what the Bible teaches. I just don't want to teach it. I just don't want to stand for it. I don't want to defend it. But then to try to argue, well, the Bible was never intended to be our, our guide is disingenuous. In World's Work by W.P. Merrill, he writes, Protestantism will keep its Bible as the supreme expression of a spiritual experience. I threw the extra A in there, just inflation. Um, spiritual experience as the highest revelation of God. As a trustworthy guide, no more to be taken literally than music or poetry are. Some of the things people come up with. I realize in the Bible there is poetry. The book of Psalms is beautiful. Song of Solomon is, is poetic. But we look at them. We understand them. By a, an appreciation of a hermeneutic. A way to study the scriptures. way to come to a, an appreciation. Because when we look at the Bible, it claims to deliver truth. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Is what Jesus himself said. And we look at it. We respect it. We honor it. Because we revere and honor Christ. As well as the Father and the Spirit. David writing in the 119th Psalm. Verse 105, thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. All the way through this 119th Psalm is a celebration of the truth of the word. First chapter, uh, first part, first several verses of the 119th Psalm. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It is truth. Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, in the uh, first letter, second chapter, he begins talking about the inspiration. After in chapter one, he talked about, where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? But now drop down second chapter, verse 10. For to us, God revealed uh, them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man, except the spirit of the man which is in him? 
Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So Paul clearly says what is revealed in his writing is via the inspiration of God. That God is revealing his mind to us. And we cannot change that. We cannot alter it. We don't have the authority to do so. And for us to just try to push it aside as a non-entity doesn't do us any good. Because as Peter writes, for God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Do you realize the importance of that statement? Everything. Everything. Life, godliness, the universe. That's life. Ralph wrote a paper, wrote down his thoughts. Thank you for sending them to me and sharing them with me. Dealing with the creation. It was impressive. Did I agree with everything Ralph said? No. But that's okay. Because Ralph was dealing with some things that quite honestly were above my pay grade. He was getting into things that Terry would only understand. And physics and things of that nature. But we recognize the creation of God. We stand back in awe of it. And we can't change it. We can't change nature at all. We look at the beauty of the plan that God has set forth. The pattern, the design. And you have to, you have to stand in awe of it. The way it works. The way that it is arranged. And we can't change it. Oh, we try. There's the quotes right there. And, and I could get you any number of other quotes that would teach the same things as these are. We just want to accept the Bible the way it is. We want to follow the designs, the pattern, the arrangement. That's all we want to do. Jesus, after he had fed the 5,000, the people are clamoring for more and more and more. But he said, I'll tell you what. I'll acknowledge that you follow me because you want to be fed. I'll give you the bread of life. Oh, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I am the bread of life. No, 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 no. That's not what we want. We want what you gave us yesterday. No. I'm going to give you the bread of life. Me. Me. Go back to John 6 chapter. It's a great discourse that goes on there. But drop in at verse, drop in at verse 63 of John 6. In verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Here's what you need. This is the design that was put in place before time was. And so here's what you need for life. You already know what you get physically. Now here's what God has promised, provided spiritually. The words that I've spoken, their spirit, their life. Drop down. Verse 68. 
Simon answered him and said, Lord, this was after a lot of those that had been following him decided they would go elsewhere. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. You and you alone. So the Bible delivers truth. And it is not merely conjecture or open to suggestions. It has a pattern. But then there comes back the argument. It needs to change with times. It needs to get, well, it needs to get jiggy with it. I don't know. I'm old. But it needs to be updated. It needs to be modernized. And I can think back before I was a Christian and being raised in a religious standpoint. But I argued. I argued with the preacher. I argued about a lot of things. And I said, it's old. It needs to be updated. And there was one minister in uh, Scotts Valley, California. And I talked to him about it. His name was Jan Jedlica. And he would go surfing and we'd enjoy those types of things. And I thought, well, he's surely he's going to entertain the idea of updating it. But I was surprised when I said it needs to be updated. And he said, no. It's beautiful the way it is. I couldn't believe it. And now looking back, I thought, what hypocrisy. Because where he preached in the Free Methodist Church, they changed everything. They changed it. They'd even changed from the methodology that John Wesley put in way back when. See, that's what the Methodist Church is named for. Methodology. They're Methodists. But we still hear that today. In order to make it more appealing to the masses, we have to change with the times. We have to begin accepting this. We have to modify our teaching regarding that. No. No. We stay steadfast to truth. The faith has been delivered one time. One time. Contend earnestly for the faith once delivered. That's Jude 3. We have it into our hands. And we are to be converted by it. We need to be transformed by it. Flip over to Romans 12, verse 1. Now I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Either renew in your mind that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. That word, that faith delivered one time, which we have here, is able to transform us. And it is a timeless message. Timeless. What was delivered on the day of Pentecost after the death of Christ and after his ascension to the right hand of the Father still holds true today. It needs not to be changed. Doesn't need anything of the kind. Doesn't need to be updated. Is not antiquated because it deals with the same things with which we deal with today in class this morning. We were talking in, about James 2. And James was dealing with the idea of prejudice. Partiality. 
we talked about it. I think we talked about it fairly openly and candidly. And that is something that plagues us to this day. And it was brought out, not only does it plague us from ethnicity as a people, but politically and the polarization they're in, politically, that's ridiculous. There should be no polarization politically. Politics, if you would, is the toy story of society. It ranks down with the level of sports. What is true, what is substantive, is our dealing and respect of one another. and not showing partiality. That's relevant. That hasn't changed since the first century. Nor have any other issues changed since the first century. Homosexuality is still a problem today. Drug abuse is still a problem today. That was the situation in, when Paul went to Ephesus. They burned their books of magic. Magic then was the word translated out sorcery or more akin pharmakeia, where we get the word pharmacy from, drugs. Talks about drug, uh, uh, drunkenness. Talks about sexual immorality. Talks about destruction of the home. Aren't those contemporary issues? All of them are. Each and every one. Is something we deal with today. Bible is timeless. It gives us answers for every one of those situations. Does it tell us how to raise children? Yep. Does it tell us about marriage? Oh, absolutely. And even in the design, so we can understand it better. We look at the father. And he looks at us as just children. Do we always respect him? No. No. Go back to Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. See how the children of Israel treated the father. But there's a pattern in playing, a design. The design for the church is Christ as head and the church as his bride. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, 22 and following. Deal with the structure they're in. And then we look at it as husband and wife relationship. Everything is there. Everything. And that was by design. The word of God does not change. And it does not need to be updated. The pattern is there. It's in place, stays in place. Go into what Peter talks about in 1 Peter, first chapter. Drop down to verse 24. Peter writes, All flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off. Now, next word's important. Next word is a conjunction. It ties back to what he just talked about. Right now, we're in we're in late spring. I know it's kind of hard to believe the way you woke up this morning. June gloom is hanging hard and heavy over us. But everything is resplendently green. Flowers are everywhere. Linda told me Joy's got amaryllis out front of her door with flowers that big. But you know what's going to happen to that amaryllis? Summer's going to come on. Flower's going to fall off. We see it in the cycle. Things die, pass away. But, verse 25, the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the, Lord, the word which was preached to you. It is forever. 
De Beers, the diamond company, has come out with an ad. A diamond is forever. And it shows a young woman like this holding her diamond and talks about your love is forever. And the diamond is a representative of that. Well, the only thing is forever is God's word. Peter, again, is impressed by that. Look at the second letter he writes. First chapter, verse 19. And we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you would do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, till the day dawns, the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spake from God. Nobody can change God's word. Nobody can. God is the sole propriety, proprietor of it. So, look a little bit further. Back in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes, Consider the work of God, for who is able to strengthen what he has bent? You stop and think about that. You go, I, that's quite profound. If God decides something is going to be a certain way, how can we change it? And the answer is you can't. You can't. So now we get into this kind of this area that people don't write, really like to think about. Uh, they don't like to think about how we interpret the scriptures. How we come to a, a certain conclusion and what we do with it and how we approach it. But it's very simple. We realize that the manifold wisdom of God is in place. We talk about the eternal purpose of God. And so what we eventually then come to realize is that in hermeneutics, the study of the Bible, you've got to figure some things out. So you begin asking some questions. Simple questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how? One of the classes that I taught had to deal with logic. How you approach things. How, how you come to decisions. Who, what, when, where, why, how. You sit down and figure it out. Same way with the Bible. You begin to look back. And you realize that God is the one in absolute authority. And so you look at the pattern. And you realize, well, you know, it works. That pattern, that design, it works. And it has worked ever since God put it in place. Man has tried to change it. And when he has, it's come up way short of the mark. So you go back to the pattern. We have a phrase called, well, you got to go back to the drawing board. Well, that's true. Dan and Randy, contractors. Dan more so in this regards. Dan has plans that has to be drawn up. He takes to the planning commission. They look at it and they go, Dan, go back to the architect. Go back to the drawing board. Dan takes the blueprints. <laughs> Goes back to the architect. Here's what the planning board said. Architect makes the changes. Dan takes them again. Then they're approved. But it was by going back to the drawing board. Going back. And the architect had to make it according to the specific patterns, designs, rules, regulations set by the county, set by the city, set by the state. You can't change it 
Dan would love to change it. He can't. He's just the builder. And then Dan brings in his workers. Dan shows them, here's what's got to happen. And what Dan then does is Dan goes and checks to make sure that they're doing it according to the pattern. And if they're not, he turns and says, Numus, take it apart. Do it again. To which Numus goes, show them what God's pattern and plan are. They come the same way. Grumble, grumble, grumble. But nobody can change it. It is that which is stated. And so you look at that Bible authority. And you go, okay, how, how do we apply it? And most of you know this already. But there's a direct command. Where something is specifically told to you. Again, Numus isn't here to defend himself. So I'll use him. Dan tells Numus, Numus, I want you to put a door in. I want you to frame it at exactly these dimensions. Go and do that. That's a direct command. Numus has no latitude. And Numus, dutiful as he is, he will go and do exactly as Dan has specified. Look at Acts 2.38. Direct command. No way to get around it. Peter has convinced those that are listening to him, pardon me, that they're guilty of sin. And they cry out after being pierced in the heart. They cry out, what must we do to be saved? Answer us. Give us direction. Peter gives them a direct command. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. There is no vacillation there. I can't come along and say, well, you can do something else. I can't. Oh, I would love to. Make it more appealing for the masses. Can't. That's what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. That's what we follow. 1 Peter 3.21 and corresponding to that. Baptism now saves you. Not the removal of filth from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. So in Acts 2.38, he verbally gives a direct command. 1 Peter 3.21, he explains even more what that command does for the one who obeys it. So that's one way. Direct command. That's easy. Second way is an approved example. The approved example is 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, verses 23, 24, 25, where they had come together in order to partake of the Lord's Supper. It was something that they did, I was going to say religiously, but it's all done that way. On the first day of the week, every first day of the week, they gathered together to partake of what? Simple elements. Unleavened bread, representative of the body of Christ. Fruit of the vine, representative of the shed blood of Christ. Why? To proclaim his death until he comes. And we partake it in a manner that looks back to that. That which we just did a little while ago is a memory hook. And it is commanded of us to do it by an approved example. The apostles, they're the ones that brought it in. That's an approved example. There are others we could look at. And the necessary inference kind of ties back to the proved example. In Acts 20, in verse 7, you notice what's, um, what's found back there. And it serves as an approved example that gives us authority. And on the first day of the week, 
when we were gathered together to break bread, i.e., partake of the Lord's Supper, Paul began talking to them, intending to depart the next day. And he prolonged his message until midnight. All right, now we got some fun here. We've got an approved example. They gathered together. They partook of the Lord's Supper. It is necessarily inferred that they did it every first day of the week. And does it give credence to the preacher to wax philosophical and poetic until midnight? No. Thank you, Dan. No. Emphatically, no. It was just an occasion that Paul was there. But you have the necessary requirements. You have an approved example. First century. You have a necessarily inferred. And you can also find another necessary inference. Go back to the book of Revelation. This will be the last one we'll look at this morning. But go into the book of Revelation. We're going to be in the first chapter. John is on the island of Patmos. And if you go down into verse 10, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, first day of the week. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. We worship God in spirit and in truth. John was engaged in worship on the first day of the week. It's necessarily inferred that that was a common practice for him each and every first day of the week. So how do we establish authority? Real simple. Did God give a direct command? If so, I can't change it. Do we have an approved example? Yeah. I've got to follow it. Can I look for a necessary inference to support what I'm doing? Yes. Well, that's the lesson this morning. But as we bring it to a conclusion, we did look at a direct command. We could have looked at a lot of others. But we definitely looked at one. What must we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message that's left behind. And that's the message we need to teach and advocate to those that we come in contact with. We cannot change it. We cannot diminish it. We simply follow the design God has put in place. If there is any here that might be subject to that invitation, we'll be glad to help you in that regards. But maybe you need prayers for of a spiritual nature. However we can be of a spiritual assistance, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.